as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the traditional owners on the land uh, we're assembling today. Uh, I'm on Ngunnawal country in Canberra, and we acknowledge uh, uh, traditional owners uh, around uh, the country, wherever people are assembling today, and elders past, present and emerging. You'll see uh, perhaps at the top of your screen that we're recording this session uh, because um, uh, many people weren't able uh, to join us today, but were keen uh, to be able to listen uh, to the discussion at a later time. Today's a really important day uh, for us in the health and climate change community because we're launching uh, three important reports here in Australia. Uh, firstly, uh, the 2020 MJ Lancet Countdown Report, published today, and also the Global Report, the Lancet Countdown Report, and importantly as well, uh, the Policy Brief for Australia, which really digests a lot of the information in the report and makes it much more accessible uh, for decision makers. I'm just gonna share my screen briefly now, with some images uh, from last summer. Here, Malakuta in Far Eastern Victoria, people sheltering on a beach. Here, an image from Sydney, and Sydney was shrouded in smoke for months. Melbourne as well our capital, and these people, of course, wearing masks uh, before the pandemic. And these were the headlines around the world in December, January. It's been an extraordinary time for us, 2020 in Australia. We had those exceptional bushfires, the rains came, and then we were faced with the pandemic. So we really haven't had an opportunity to process those fires yet as a country. And as you'd know, just last weekend in Sydney, we had record breaking temperatures, back to back days, 40 degrees, in Western Sydney before the start of summer, before the official start of summer. People are anxious. In the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, there were fires. Elvis helicopter was out fighting those fires. And people were very anxious because they remembered last summer. So today, we're going to continue uh, to understand that summer in these reports. And to get us started, I'd like to pass over uh, to Associate Professor Ying Zhang from the University of Sydney, who's the co-chair of the MJA Lancet Countdown here in Australia. Thank you, Tony. And thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm speaking from Camarigo's land today. And I pay my respect to the past, present, and the future. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to sh share this exciting moment with you all. Um, I am very fortunate to co-chair this um, MJ Lansing Countdown with Associate Professor Paul Bex uh, at Macquarie University. Uh, please let me give you a very brief introduction of the project itself on behalf of the team. Um, the MJ Lansing Countdown aims to track the progress of health and climate change research in Australia in collaboration with the Lansing Countdown on Health and Climate Change and, and the Medical Journal of Australia. Um, the team was established in late 2017 after the publication of the first Lansing Countdown Global Report. Uh, with a multidisciplinary group of experts from 13 institutions across the country. And thanks, Tony, for being the key driver of the great initiative, um, and some of the other team members are here with us today. 
um, we, we published the first report in 2018 and updated it in 2019. Uh, we largely followed the methodological framework of the Lansing County on Global Report, but used a more uh, Australian database uh, wherever we could and adjusted for the Australian context in our reports. Uh, in the first report, we examined uh, 40, 41 indicators that covered five sections, including health impacts, adaptation, uh, mitigation and co-benefits, uh, finance and economy, and public and political engagement. Uh, we are very pleased to see that our publications have been used widely by stakeholders in the country to advocate for more actions on health and climate change issues. And this year's special report, uh, as you can see, which uh, uh, was just released this morning, uh, we did not update all the indicators, but uh, uh, focused on the 12 uh, bushfire-related indicators in the five sections. Um, it not uh, only highlighted the lessons learned from the uh, Black Summer bushfire disaster, but also uh, identified opportunities to engage with and act on climate change issues uh, in order to protect Australians' um, health, uh, especially uh, in the recovery from the uh, global pandemic. Uh, and we, we are also very proud that Australia were, was the first and only country to be able to uh, develop our uh, own national level countdown report on health and climate change. And this year we see that China also published its first national countdown report and several other countries are following us. So our plan is to um, uh, publish the annual reports until 2030 in line with the time frame of the Australian's emission target for the Paris Agreement. Uh, we hope the reports, uh, as well as the uh, brief for uh, policymakers, will assist in um, policy and decision making in addressing health and climate change issues in the country. Um, you would all agree with me that um, there is no doubt that all collective efforts from multiple sectors are required uh, to make the changes in order to achieve a better and uh, a healthier future for Australia. And please help us uh, distribute the publications to your network if you could. And uh, uh, feel free to get in touch with us if you need more information. And thank you very much. Very much, Ying. And uh, Ying has put in the chat box of this call uh, the link uh, to the paper where you can download it uh, directly from the journal if you haven't uh, got a copy of the report yet. So next, um, we are going to hear by video uh, from Professor Anthony Costello at the University College London. And he is uh, the co-chair of the Global Lancet Countdown. I think Georgia is going to show that short video. Well, greetings. I can show my video. Okay, thank you very much. Oh no. Well, greetings and thanks to Tony Capon for organizing once again the meeting uh, which will lead up to the next uh, Australia report linked to the Lancet Countdown. Just to remind everyone that Lancet Countdown really kind of began in 2007 when Richard Horton asked University College London to set up their first commission, which was on climate change and health. And two years later, we reported when we said that climate change was the greatest health threat, global health threat of the 21st century. And that caused a lot of scepticism uh, at the time. I'm sure it wouldn't anymore. 
We followed it up in 2014 with a second report, which um, basically turned it on its head and said, look, uh, uh, climate change is actually a, a huge global health opportunity because everything that you want to do uh, for climate change is good for your health. Um, but we realized we needed then some kind of annual process that would really focus on progress towards this critical decarbonization. And so um, we set up a countdown. We've had annual reports since 2016, and now we're thrilled to have uh, the pioneering Australia report, but also setting up regional uh, centers uh, around the world. And we, we now have 38 universities uh, involved, institutes, sustainability units, and we produce reports from five working groups on climate change impacts on health, on adaptation to climate change, uh, mitigation and health code benefits, uh, an important one on the economics and finance for effective action, and one on public and political engagement. And we choose indicators based on, from the literature, an indicator that will track an aspect of the relationship between health and climate. Uh, we have to have data availability with geographical and temporal coverage. It needs to be applicable across a range of resource and cultural settings. And we really want indicators that can be updated annually, and most important of all, have policy relevance. Now, in Australia, I don't need to tell any of you that climate change is, is threatening the health of populations across the country. It's intensifying storms, extreme weather events, affecting crop production, and of course, worsening wildfires, but also floods and droughts, and it's altering the spread of infectious diseases and also exacerbating inequality, poverty, migration, and mental ill health. And um, rainfall, for example, in southwestern Australia has just fallen, I think, by nearly 20% since the 1970s. And southeastern Australia, also a, a more moderate decline since the 1990s. And so global heating is really going to negatively impact your environment, economy, communities, and you are especially vulnerable, actually, because of your extensive arid and semi-arid areas, uh, your already warm climate, you have quite high rainfall variability, and there's quite a lot of pressures on your water supply. And of course, you're a coastal area population, so you and your tourism industry depend crucially on not being flooded and the health of the Great Barrier Reef and other fragile ecosystems. Um, but, you know, if we can get this right, then ultimately there will be benefits for human health with cleaner air, healthier diets, and more livable cities. So you're working to ensure that health is at the center of how governments across the continent uh, understand and respond to climate change. Um, and you need to give them the high quality evidence-based guidance through to providing the health profession with the tools they need to improve public health. So I wish you well with the meeting under the direction of Tony Capon, your meeting and reports will promote the national level uh, research that policymakers in Australia need. Um, and of course, you know, the response to climate change really could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. So thank you very much. Um, when this pesky pandemic is over, I, I really look forward to being invited to join you in Australia. And I was thinking maybe over New Year 2021-22, when the Sydney Test match will be on and we can all celebrate England recapturing the ashes. So having said that, thank you. Have a great meeting. Well, thanks um, very much, uh, Ying and George, uh, for broadcasting that. And uh, great to hear uh, from Anthony Costello. And uh, I think the message of hope at the end is really important that, uh, you know, if we get on, 
and make the necessary changes, this will be a good thing for human health and well-being, not just preventing the health impacts of climate change, but also enabling people to enjoy healthy lives from more physical activity, from walking and cycling, less polluted air uh, around the country, all of those so-called co-benefits for health. There's a really positive story here for us. And that brings us now uh, to Georgia, uh, who is uh, just completed her medical studies at University of Notre Dame, Australia. And she's also uh, the chair of the Australian Medical Students Association's uh, Global uh, Health Board and the chair of the Student Committee for Doctors for Environment Australia. So she, Georgia is one busy person. So uh, over to you, Georgia, uh, to uh, uh, bring us up to speed uh, on this year's policy brief. Well, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. As a very baby brand new doctor, it's a real privilege and exciting opportunity to be speaking amongst so many really eminent colleagues today. Um, and I'm here to chat to you about the policy brief that's being released to accompany the two reports we're hearing about today. Um, I was uh, really excited to be the lead author of this uh, brief this year, um, which has been produced in collaboration with the Australian Medical Association, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, and um, the mighty Australian Medical Students Association, of which I'm a very proud kind of recent alumni. Um, now, I am speaking today from Murawaga country in Nipaluna or Hobart, um, and just like to acknowledge country. Um, I'm chatting today about the policy briefing, which is a document that basically takes the findings of these two reports that we have, both the global and Australian report, and translates them into some very concrete recommendations for what our government, and in particular our federal government, should be doing over the next few years to deal with some of the challenges and opportunities that have been presented to us um, in this report and in the year in general. Um, given the incredible year that we've had with the COVID-19 pandemic, when we were talking with all of our collaborators and partners in developing this policy brief, we agreed that all of our recommendations had to do three main things. They had to preserve the climate, they had to protect public health and sort of promote general public well-being in a variety of other ways, and they had to promote economic sustainability, contribute to an economy that is going to support those social determinants of health that we all know are really important for general well-being as well. So what we did is we got together a group of experts, both our partner organisations and also wonderful academics and policy stakeholders, and gathered their expertise together to get together three main recommendations. The recommendations that we came up with were, um, so we have three of them. The first is to invest in health, and we do that by direct stimulus spending towards renewable energy and public and active transport. The second is to foster resilience by investing in preparing and supporting communities that might be affected by climate disasters. And the third is to pr protect well-being by developing a national climate change and health strategy. Why did we come up with these three recommendations in particular? Well, first of all, we know that these are going to be recommendations that help to reduce Australia's emissions, which is really the single most important thing that we can do to minimise the scale of climate change and therefore the negative health impacts that it's going to have on the Australian population. And that can be from doing anything like investing in massive renewable energy projects that we've seen happening in New South Wales this week, or investing in small scale community grids that might help communities that are affected by disasters and get cut off from national grids. Um, we also know that these are going to be the sorts of recommendations that make people healthier straight away by doing things like reducing air pollution, um, getting them up and active, as Tony was speaking about before, and also protecting their mental well-being by investing in their communities and promoting the security of those communities in the future. We also know that these are going to be policy recommendations that help us to kind of harness the enormous potential of Australia to provide healthy, meaningful work for people um, and become sort of economically sustainable into the future. Um, and so we think these are really strong policy recommendations that we really urge the government to consider as we kind of reorient ourselves in the, um, in, in the COVID world, in this, this new era um, with the new um, government coming in in America and some of the positioning that's been happening around the world um, in the past little while. Um, obviously we can make all these recommendations, but it's 
to everyone who is attending here today to go out and talk to policy stakeholders and your representatives and encourage them to discuss these with their colleagues and make this part of their party platform. I'd really encourage everyone who's here today to go and have a look at this on the web countdown website we'll add a link in here and if possible to share this with policy stakeholders who you may have access to um, it's been a real privilege and a really wonderful opportunity to work with all of our partners and we're looking forward to hearing from a few of them shortly thanks for the opportunity to have a chat to you and uh, looking forward to seeing all you get out there and getting your politicians implementing these recommendations in the weeks ahead Thanks very much, Georgia. That's terrific. And uh, the policy brief is a really important part of uh, the countdown process because it's much more accessible than some of the longer, more scholarly reports and really does help with uh, the translation of the research into policy and practice. So thanks very much for your leadership on that, Georgia. Now we'd like to hear from Omar Kashid, who is the president of the Australian Medical Association. So over to you, Omar. Thanks, Tony, and, and thanks a lot to Georgia for sharing that, that really amazing work. Yet, yet again, young doctors are putting uh, some of uh, us more senior in the profession to shame, um, and uh, the policy brief is fantastic, and, and even pitched to the level where, where the average orthopedic surgeon can understand it. So um, well done. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation um, in the very dry corner of uh, Western Australia where I'm sitting at the moment. Although uh, typically when we're talking about climate change, we've actually just had the wettest and coldest November ever. Um, so that just, just shows you things are a, a little variable. But I would like to pay my respects to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people uh, around the country and on, on our call today. The AMA is really pleased to be endorsing the policy brief uh, in particular for the MJ Lancet Countdown, uh, along with the College of Physicians and AMSA. Uh, we took the step in September 2019, despite years of policy on climate change, of actually announcing our recognition of climate change as a health emergency, uh, with really clear scientific evidence uh, indicating the, uh, the severe impacts that we expect on our patients uh, and our communities um, uh, now and into the future. Now, at the time, the announcement did uh, get a fair bit of attention, uh, quite a bit of praise from the media and a lot of uh, our membership, uh, a lot of the wider medical community. Uh, but we also received some significant criticism. Uh, those who were telling us uh, that doctors should stick to the medicine, to stick, stick to treating patients and stay out of these debates on environmental, economic and social issues. Um, However, it didn't take long, it was just a few months later that we were so abruptly and devastatingly reminded of just how severe the health impacts of climate change can be. And as we're uh, seeing in the countdown report, the 1920 bushfire season resulted in, in 33 tragic deaths, uh, probably 417 excess deaths, along with thousands of hospitalizations with uh, cardiovascular and respiratory problems. Uh, so really concrete and believable demonstration of how real this, uh, this issue is. Um, more than me out in the West, uh, I'm sure you guys uh, experienced the, the horrible sense of dread uh, that was associated uh, with the smoke that blanketed the whole uh, eastern side of the country. Uh, I only saw it once flying into to Sydney and I have to say, uh, having read about it and seen it on the TV, it was quite different when you, you were immersed in it, uh, you know, flying through it in the air. Uh, absolutely horrific and I can only imagine what it was like living through that. The, the mental health impact of this fire season, along uh, with those uh, on those living in affected communities, as well as our general population, won't be fully understood for a very long time. Now, medical practitioners were directly confronted with the health impacts of that fire season. GPs in the affected areas rushed to provide adequate care for their patients, often in really difficult circumstances. The patients needed care for breathing issues, injuries, wounds, but also their chronic health conditions. They still needed to be looked after, but without the normal levels of access. Um, in Nowra, uh, as an example, on, on uh, New South Wales South Coast, local GP, Dr. Kate Anderson, set up a temporary clinic at an evacuation centre, only to face administrative hurdles in being allowed to operate there. Further afield in Canberra, Steve Robson delivered a baby on the 1st of January in a smoky operating theatre on a day when the city experienced its worst air quality on record at more than 23 times uh, what's uh, thought to be a hazardous level. Absolutely horrific. That bushfire season brought home for many Australians, and what is so 
what is so aptly highlighted in the uh, in the countdown publications is that doctors, us, we have a vital role in advocating for healthier policy on climate. It is our patients and our communities that are affected. It is us who need to be there to provide trusted, sensitive, life-saving care during an emergency, but also in the longer term. It's also our workplaces, our health facilities that are devastatingly impacted when everything goes wrong and we need to be ready. We need to be equipped for those challenges. That's why I'm speaking to you today and it's why the AMA has endorsed the 2020 policy brief. The three recommendations are central to our AMA policy and they've got important implications for all medical professionals. We need to accelerate our shift to renewables. We need to be investing in energy and transport infrastructure to uh, enable a more active community. We need to lower our emissions. We need to set firm targets. These measures are vital if we're going to limit the warming to the one and a half degrees that most of the world has signed up to and avoid these worsening health impacts. We also need to be getting on with disaster planning. We need to prepare our communities because a lot of this is set in stone. It is happening right now. And we want to see more medical involvement in those, prepar in those preparations, especially local GPs who need to be at the core of uh, the response in communities. So finally, the development of a national climate change and health strategy. This is something that the AMO has supported for a long time. We need this to firmly situate climate change as a health issue to enable proper comprehensive adaptation plans and help us reduce our own very, very significant emissions in the health, in the health sector. I do want to mention COVID-19 just before I finish. Uh, you can't have any conversation at the moment well without talking about COVID-19. We have done an amazing job in controlling transmission of this infectious disease by listening to health experts, by taking strong evidence-based policies forward, and we've had great success in achieving it. We've done the same in tobacco control. We've done the same with the road toll. We need to use these strategies in climate change. I think that's been very starkly demonstrated this year. So these publications launched today provide an alarming picture on where we are with climate and health in Australia but they also provide us a clear and evidence path forward. As a doctor, it is my role and the role of my colleagues in the AMA to advocate on these policies, which are so important for health Australians. Thank you. Thanks very much, Omar. It's terrific um, to have the, the strong engagement from the AMA, which is such a vitally important organisation with members uh, across the country. And now uh, to uh, Professor John Wilson, who is the president of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, a long-term strategic partner of this countdown process. Thank you very much indeed, Tony. It's great to see you and other members of the meeting again uh, and to be back in the, uh, the climate change arena uh, and, and thank you very much to Omar for bringing the AMA along and together with AMSA, we have a very good strategic alliance and a good platform on which to go forward. I think that um, the role of the RACP is uh, really there to tell us about the, the medical issues associated with climate change and then to, uh, and then to elevate that in a way that Omar described, the level of importance that we see with other uh, important health challenging conditions. We, we already have an obesity epidemic. We already have problems with uh, COVID-19. We already have those. But the one that's creeping up on us is climate change. And we do need to see some action on that. So our college has, um, on the next slide, uh, produced a number of position statements talking about the place of climate change in health and recommends raising awareness to the highest possible level, engaging our legislators in talking to the community about the issues of climate change and how the community should respond to that and protect themselves. We already have uh, worked on the issue of environmentally sustainable healthcare, knowing that at least 7% of this country's footprint is associated, carbon footprint is associated with the healthcare industry and it can be contained and it will be. It is important also to think through just what those environmental benefits of uh, managing the climate change situation really are. 
in terms of uh, reducing fossil fuel dependency, efficient homes and buildings. And Tony joined us in our college earlier this year, talking about uh, healthy cities and healthy living. And, uh, and it is a key issue for our Congress. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I really wanted to say that the RACP, if we can go to the next one, thank you, um, uh, would like to emphasize a number of important aspects of climate change. And we heard from uh, others that, of course, bushfires are one manifestation of the changing climate, only one. And, uh, and of course, there were uh, innumerable uh, uh, healthcare events that were associated with that, not just the unexpected excess deaths, and uh, not just the hospital admissions, but in addition to that, many other uh, impacts on quality of life and health presentations. Uh, we uh, urge a strong focus on the link between environment and health in the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act review. Don't step back from this. Be part of that review. Make the contribution, contribution that is convincing. And in addition to that, we have endorsed the, uh, the Doctors for the Environment uh, campaign in our letter to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, calling for public health to be central. Now more than ever, public health physicians are absolutely vital to uh, our control of the situation. I'd just now like to say uh, in wrapping up that we must continue advocacy through media releases, releases, our submissions, social media and other channels to make sure that the key stakeholders are supported, the Climate and Health Alliance and the College of Physicians is a member of that. We must also band together when we are looking at ways in which we can act together as a responsible health community to support uh, our citizens and indeed to influence government. Up to this point, we have a voice. We must have impact. So I implore all of those involved in this climate change conference to be part of that movement, to exercise your capacity to influence government, to change their position and now be responsive to the risks of climate change. I acknowledge the land on which I speak to you today, which is that of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation. I thank you very much for, your, uh, for listening to this, and I support this uh, with all of the power of our college. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thanks very much, John. And um, certainly the College of Physicians has been active uh, uh, for some time in this area. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be one of the fellows of uh, the Faculty of Public Health Medicine in the college to see this leadership. And, and John, in particular, the way that you're engaging across uh, the various medical colleges now and uh, leading together, is uh, it's, it's a really important contribution. So now I'm delighted uh, uh, to invite uh, Helen Haynes, MP, uh, the independent uh, federal member for the seat of Indi, who is also the co-chair of Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action, uh, a perspective uh, uh, from Parliament House. Over to you, Helen. Well, thank you so very much, Tony. And I've, I've really um, been listening with, with great interest in, uh, in the speakers before me, and I thank each and every one of them. Thank you, Ying, too, for your assistance today. And I'm coming to you today from uh, Canberra, which is uh, uh, the, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders. Um, as we've heard today, this report makes three key policy recommendations to invest in renewable energy and transport as health measures, to foster resilience in communities so that they can weather disasters and bounce back, to protect well-being with a national climate change and health strategy. And as the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action, I am pushing very hard for all of those things, I can assure you. Um, I come from North East Victoria, and the practical implementation of these recommendations makes a lot of sense for a community like mine. Regional communities are directly experiencing the impacts of climate change on their health right now. 
In the summer fires, like many Australians, my electorate was completely blanketed in thick smoke for months and our usually pristine alpine valleys had worse air quality than Delhi and Beijing. Our GPs sent me reports now, just recently, of women who were pregnant at the time uh, of that thick, acrid smoke having birth complications uh, with uh, some, some direct case reports of some pretty, pretty awful looking placentas. Um, of course, uh, just case reports at this point, but uh, they've noticed them enough to, to get on the phone and tell me about it. And of course, there have been significant mental health issues that have been well documented and severe respir respiratory distress, the emergency physicians have told me uh, from across my region. In the community of Koryong, which is in the far northeast corner of, of my electorate up near the Murray River, it was encircled by flames. The principal of the local school uh, has told me that a, a psychologist visited their kindergarten recently and uh, assessed the young children there and found that 60% of the children are suffering from uh, signs of PTSD in the post-bush bush fire period. And we also know that these effects are long lasting. King Lake and Marysville, also in my electorate in the southern part, were ground zero for the Black Saturday fires over a decade ago. And we know that the mental health impacts of those fires are still incredibly prominent in those communities, as are the impacts on, uh, on increased amounts of family violence. Uh, we know also that the children who were very young during those fires 10 years ago are experiencing learning difficulties uh, right through uh, to today. This is a taste of climate's impact uh, and what it means for communities such as mine. And the solutions put forward in this report are practical and sensible ones that can make a huge difference for all of us. And I'm particularly excited about the recommendation to invest in community renewable energy systems as a resilience measure. I've spent much of 2020 uh, speaking with community energy groups right across my electorate about their plans to develop projects like solar, community batteries, pumped hydro storage. And Indi has always been Australia's leader in community energy, but the issues have taken on more salience since the fires. The town of Walwa was cut off from power at the height of the fires, leaving the Bush Nursing Hospital isolated for no, with no electricity for days. The Victorian government a few months ago awarded the hospital a grant for a small solar and battery system so they won't be cut off again. Similarly, in Koryong, which gets all its power from a single line out of Wodonga, was cut off in the fires and it had no power for a week. And this meant that they had no uh, telecommunications either. And the college became an emergency shelter for 600 people for that week. People of all ages and stages and indeed many people with pre-existing chronic disease. And a few weeks ago, Corion College too was awarded a grant for a rooftop solar and battery project so that this energy loss will never happen again. And the Upper Murray region has also submitted a bid for a multi-million dollar microgrid project that would connect up critical community assets and provide greater energy storage so that the entire community can be more resilient in the event of another crisis. And it's these kinds of investments that are exactly what we should be doing. And it's fantastic that people are increasingly recognising them as investments in our resilience and investments in our health. I've put forward a plan to Parliament that we should be establishing a new federal agency. Indeed, I'm drafting the legislation for that right now. It's called the Australian Local Power Agency to significantly increase investment in community renewable systems precisely to boost the resilience of regional communities in the face of increasing drought and bushfire risks. And I've done that work in collaboration with regional communities right across the nation. And we've developed a significant policy called the Local Power Plan as a co-designed policy to the federal government. But we also need to be investing in research. And Albury Wodonga Health, the major health centre in my electorate, has outlined a proposal for a new research institute located at the hospital. The proposal is for a $40 million research and education hub into the impacts of natural disasters. And the, the fact that they're doing this is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite new for them because they realise now as a regional health service that this would make a huge impact in understanding and preparing for increased and more intense bushfires and drought that we know is coming unless we can do something about reducing our emissions. So right now, Albury Wodonga Health, which services an enormous area with 250,000 people, is sending mental health workers right across the region 
to deliver acute mental health care to bushfire survivors. We're one year on almost, and the need is greater than ever. So ultimately, ultimately we know nationally our model isn't working. A new research institute located not just in the cities, but closer to the communities that actually experience the full force of these natural disasters is precisely the type of investment we should be making, given we know what the future is. I've put forward that proposal to government and I hope that research like this Lancet report will shift the dial on investments like these for communities like mine and many others around Australia. I thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak briefly today and I thank you most sincerely for this powerful, important and timely research. Well, thank you um, very much, Helen. Uh, uh, we greatly value your leadership uh, in the Australian Parliament and as a, as a health researcher yourself, you know, you fully understand uh, uh, the importance of research in this context and that community-based research is marvellous to hear about uh, that proposal uh, coming from your region around these things and uh, we'll look forward to supporting that as well. So uh, now is uh, the time for us to hear from some of the other authors of the report. And uh, first to Associate Professor Faye Johnson, who's with the Menzies Institute for Health Research at the University of Tasmania. Over to you, Faye. Um, thanks, Tony, and hello, everyone. And um, thank you for having me. And it's been a really great project to be a part of, working with so many fantastic people. Um, I'm speaking to you like Georgia from the um, traditional lands of the Moanina people in Nipaluna. Nipaluna Hobart. And I actually particularly want to, having someone who's studied bushfires and landscape fires for my entire career, um, acknowledge the skillful landscape management and skillful use of fire over millennia by Aboriginal Australians and how much we've got to learn from them. Um, so I'm a public health physician and environmental epidemiologist. I study all sorts of things, but fires in particular and fire smoke. And my particular contributions to this report related to the impacts of fires through time and the impacts of smoke um, over the last 20 years and over the last season in particular. So having watched fire disasters increasing all around the globe and working with communities around the globe and seeing um, increasing disasters in Australia, um, it's no understatement to say that our last season was completely off the dial. So um, our team... Um, I led the team that estimated the, made the first estimate of the initial number of deaths, over 400 deaths, and over 3,000 hospital admissions um, attributable to smoke from the last season's fires. And um, when we followed those exact same methods for the last 20 years, it was um, about 10 times greater than the median impact over the last 20 years. Um, and the nearest next disaster didn't come anywhere close, 2002 to 2003 fire season. Um, we were also able to, um, as Ivan will talk to you about um, air pollution from other sources, but um, when you place an economic figure on that, the smoke alone from last season, um, our estimate of economic impacts was around um, 2 billion Australian dollars um, for smoke alone. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. It's just yet one indicator and you're going to hear many more, um, but it's only going to get worse and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So um, fires in particular are something we all need to be skilled with and working um, vigorously to mitigate the underlying cause, which is of course our heating climate. So thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Faye. And, um... Uh, your leadership on uh, this work has really been greatly valued all around the country. So uh, we're delighted to have you um, as part of the MJA Lancet Countdown process. Uh, so next, I think we're going to hear from Ivan Hannigan at uh, the University of Sydney. Thanks, Tony. So following on from Faye's work on the bushfire smoke impacts, the indicators that I worked on focused on the air pollution in cities, which mostly comes from the human use of fossil fuels. Generally, we looked at the annual average level of pollution, but this year we also showed the month by month levels alongside the annual levels in figure four. And that uh, figure shows clearly that that annual level uh, is much higher whenever there is an extreme event, such as the bushfires in 2001, two and three, and again in 2019 and 20. And the mega dust storm in 2009 is also clearly apparent, elevating that annual average. These events were so extreme. 
But what we also see from this figure is that that annual average hides some other important sources of pollution, such as wood heater smoke from uh, humans in, in Tasmania and in the ACT, which occurs every winter. This is something that we humans can do something about. We found that several thousand premature deaths per year can be attributed in our cities to human air pollution, which even impacts the life expectancy of our children. We also estimated an economic cost of this mortality at over $5 billion per year. And that is the tip of the iceberg, that's only the deaths. The main point of these indicators is to show that the health impacts of air pollution in our cities is avoid that is avoidable if we could curb our use of fossil fuels, and this would be a co-benefit of mitigating future climate change. What this means is that while the most of the big health impacts of climate change will be felt in the future in several decades from now, it's also important to recognise that actions right now will result in immediate benefits by reducing the current burden of disease for human air pollution. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ivan. Uh, it's great uh, to have you as part of the team as well, bringing um, your expertise in data science uh, to bear in uh, tracking the indicators. Now, uh, our final speaker from the panel today is uh, Professor Martina Linaluca, who is the Director of the Centre for Corporate Sustainable Sustainability and Environmental Finance at uh, the Business School at Macquarie University. So uh, it's clear that we have this uh, multidisciplinary perspective in the countdown. It's not just health researchers. Uh, we, we bring perspectives from other disciplines as well. So thanks very much. Over to you, Martina. Thank you so much, um, Tony. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian of the Macquarie University land today, the Watamogaga clan of the Darug Nation. So um, as Tony already mentioned, I am the section lead for section three, the mitigation actions and health core benefits. And this section looked at the broader mitigation response and the societal transition towards a greener and hopefully a cleaner future ahead of us. Um, what we found is that Australia's mitigation and climate change response remains uh, um, inadequate. Essentially, Australia is the only OECD country to have worsened its carbon intensity of its energy supply over the last uh, three decades, which is quite significant. So this is now 36% worse than the global average. So Australia is really not tracking well here. It is still continuing to have a very heavy reliance on coal. Wind and solar power are growing. So we have some hope here and some optimism, but we still see that they're a very small share of the total generation. So in conclusion, the findings that we have available in the countdown assessment report is presenting also some further information around you know the possibility that we see an increase in these disasters and disaster costs ultimately that means that Australian policymakers here need to do much more to really Australia uh, to really prepare Australia for a, cha for a change future ahead and with inaction on climate change we really see essentially that there is a combination of impacts ranging not just from the health impacts, but also implications for the economic system, the energy transition, um, and an increase of risk in society. So I think based on the findings in particular, also uh, factoring in the economic impacts, um, I think there is a strong need to foster the resilience um, of this country and to really invest in a national strategy that considers the health implications, but also the economic impact implications and the economic transitions to a cleaner future. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for those remarks as well, Martina. I think that's one of the real strengths of this countdown process is that we have these different disciplinary perspectives uh, coming together. So now we've got a few minutes um, for any Q&A and um, uh, I'm not sure I can see anything yet in the chat box. But I might um, perhaps just pose a question to Helen Haynes. Uh, Helen, I recall um, uh, in February this year uh, speaking in Parliament uh, uh, at uh, the invitation 
of uh, the Rural Health Alliance um, for Australia. And of course, at that time, you know, we were just uh, starting to come to terms uh, with the extent of, of these uh, exceptional fires. But of course, 2020's uh, really been largely about the pandemic. So, so what's, the, what's your sense of what's happening in Parliament? How are people thinking about it as we come up to summer? We had that extreme heat uh, uh, event in Eastern Australia just at the weekend. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the tone of the conversation in Parliament? Uh, Tony, I'm disappointed to say that there isn't much conversation about bushfires at all in Parliament. Uh, right now. And uh, it's really been um, the voices of myself and uh, uh, the, the member for Eden Monero, uh, the member for Macquarie, whose electorates were very significantly impacted um, by bushfires, uh, who are raising this continually in the parliament, uh, as we're now in another bushfire season, of course. And I can speak to the level of anxiety in my own community, uh, who, of course, had the, the intersection of bushfire recovery and COVID uh, and uh, the level of distress is extremely high because those communities have not had the, the opportunity to come together as they may have uh, in a full recovery process and uh, there's been significant delays in, in getting on with, uh, with clean up uh, and indeed rebuild. So um, the focus in the parliament has been very much on pandemic and on economic um, recovery. And uh, I think you made the point earlier that it's, uh, it's subsumed everything else. But of course, what many of us realize is uh, with a warming planet, the um, frequency of bushfires is, uh, is going to be uh, higher, but also the, the possibility of, of other pandemics too. Mm. So That's I, I mean, it's a bit depressing, doesn't it? But I, I, I would, I have to be honest, there hasn't been a lot of discussion outside of some, some work uh, in regard to the recommendations of the Bushfire Royal Commission. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Helen. You make a very important point there that um, uh, climate change, environmental change more generally is relevant to the pandemic as well because this spillover of new pathogens uh, from animals to people it occurs in the context of these changes, whether it's forest loss, biodiversity loss, urbanization, climate change, there's new opportunities for contact between wild animals, uh, people, domestic animals, and, uh, and the spillover. <laughs> And so I think uh, this is well understood in scientific circles, but is not really yet part of the discourse in wider society in any systematic way. And certainly um, I think uh, not yet in the parliaments as you point out. Um, now, I think I've got something here in the chat box. Um, I might throw to Paul Beggs. He's got a question um, uh, for, for a couple of our speakers. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, just a question for John and Omar. Um, Thank you very much for your presentations today. Um, I was wondering if you have a feel for the perception of health and climate change by uh, your members, um, so GPs and specialists around Australia. Mm, sure, I, I can, Omar, I might just give a very short reply first, if it's okay. Uh, I, I, I'll give you a view. Uh, it is changing and very quickly. And we get that because uh, we're now noticing that committees people nominating for positions, feedback from members, uh, discussion topics at congresses, and now turning towards climate change in a way it never did before. That's, that's a temporal thing. The second is, let's be absolutely honest here, the demographic of our college is changing really rapidly. Young folks today are far more concerned about the future than uh, the retiring members of the profession. I'm sorry, Omar, I'm trying to be uh, as polite as possible about, uh, about our members, but, but the awareness of uh, older members of uh, the colleges is more about um, the, the way that they see the world and the way that they've always practiced medicine because it always went that way. But unfortunately, that's not the way of the world now. It's changed so quickly that the new demographic of younger members, younger fellows, is all about the future. And there is no belief that it's staying stable. And there is a constant understanding that, the, that there will be change. 
So planning for the future is far more important than it's ever been. And maybe that's the message we need to get to government. Sorry, John. Uh, I think you, you, you've answered the question very well, John, and I, I agree with those points. We, we are definitely seeing a, a, a change within the medical profession, uh, having had to run in a competitive election. Uh, I can say that climate change came up again and again in my discussions with the, the delegates who had, had the votes. Um, and you know, since I've been in this role, we've had a number of things to say about climate change, including supporting uh, Zali Stegall's bill and being reasonably public about that. And there's just been no negative feedback. And, and that's actually surprised me that, that our traditional core membership who a few years ago would have been pretty out there saying, why are you straying into this territory? Uh, we're not receiving that at the moment. So I'm confident that, that our profession is seeing what's going on. Uh, yes, it's a little bit of demographic change, but I think it's also uh, the stark demonstration that climate change is real, that, that's actually um, uh, making it, uh, and I think the link that we've all been talking about, the link to health, I think it is having an impact within the medical profession. Great, thank you very much, John and Omar. Yep. Thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. And now we're actually already at time, but I did see earlier a question in the Q&A box from um, uh, Michael Williams. Uh, and perhaps I might address this question to Faye Johnson in the first instance. How is the mortality due to air pollution established? And is there an estimate of morbidity uh, due to air pollution as well? Uh, sure, I can answer that. Um, to do a rapid health impact assessment, as you know, you can do the epidemiological studies and get the air pollution and actually measure deaths, but that takes years to get the data, and it's not something that gives us timely information. So what we did in this instance was a health impact assessment. Uh, we have very good information about the air pollution, and there's really good information about the relationship between air pollution and death rates in the community. So you can get quite you know, robust estimates. If you know the air pollution, if you know your community and the underlying death rate, and you know what the multiplier is. Um, so in our work, we did it for deaths and we did it for admissions to hospital for cardiovascular and respiratory conditions and asthma ED attendances. And it was restricted to those. There are many more outcomes, of course, from um, severe bushfires and bushfire smoke but they're the ones where we had the robust multipliers and we could be confident in the estimates that we made. Thanks uh, very much, Faye. So it's, uh, it's now my role, of course, um, to draw things to a close. I guess um, it's been a terrific discussion today. It's great to see these uh, three publications out today. And indeed, I understand tomorrow, uh, the West Australian government will be releasing the report of the Chief Health Officer review of uh, the, uh, the inquiry there into climate and health by the West Australian government uh, uh, undertaken by our colleague, Professor Taran Wiramanthri. So, so that's another important um, happening tomorrow. And uh, perhaps uh, to conclude with a shout out uh, to um, uh, the NHMRC, you'll note in our uh, MJA report this year uh, that we highlight uh, the NHMRC special initiative on uh, uh, human health and environmental change, uh, which is uh, good uh, to see uh, this investment in building research uh, capacity and capability around the country. I know that Helen Haynes, um, uh, you've been a strong voice for this in Parliament and, and we, uh, we greatly appreciate that. So um, it, uh, all it remains to do is to, to thank all our speakers, thank all our participants, and perhaps a particular shout out to Paul Beggs, um, who is co-chair uh, of uh, the MJA Lancet Countdown uh, with Ying Zhang. Uh, so thanks everybody, and uh, enjoy um, the evening wherever you are on uh, traditional lands around the country and uh, people around the world too. So thanks everybody. <laughs>